As fitness enthusiasts, we love to hear human interest stories where exercise and community have played a vital role in the transforming of people's lives. Behind any documentary are hours and hours of footage left behind on the editing room floor. Oftentimes, as viewers of these remarkable stories, we are left wanting more. We've created Beyond the Journal to dig a little deeper. Hear how their 15 minutes of fame has impacted their journey. We'll see where they are now and what's next. If you like what you hear, please write a review, give us a five-star rating, and subscribe to the podcast. We're also available on YouTube for your viewing pleasure. You can check us out there at the Clydesdale Fitness and Friends. I'm Scott Schweitzer. And I'm Kat Shear. And, and we're, we're taking, taking you Beyond, beyond the, the Journal. journal. Hey everyone, welcome to Beyond the Journal with the Clydesdale and Cat. Today we have a very special guest, uh, Terry Sloyer. Terry, how are you doing? I'm well, thanks. And we're going to talk to Terry because back in September of 2019, CrossFit shared a post that she had done uh, where uh, it was a before and after picture and uh it was a tremendous transformation. And so we want to kind of get to know Terry and see what created this pivotal moment and where she is today. Sound good, Terry? Sounds like a plan. Yep. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. So where did you grow up? What I lovingly refer to as the armpit of the United States of America, Hutchinson, Kansas. Okay. I've always called the armpit Tallahassee, Florida, but they I always might, call it. I always call it the, the Mid Atlantic region where I'm from. <laughs> it's also the armpit. <laughs> well, in Hutchinson, Kansas, that is where the horizon meets the land, and there's zero elevation anywhere, and it gets up to minus five in the winter time and 105 in the summertime. It's wow. awful. It's wow. an incredibly awful place. No, no diss to anybody that lives in Hutchinson. It's just not a place for me. Yeah, yeah. So where do you live now? We live in Houston, Texas. Nice. Well, so yeah. growing up, did you do did you do anything athletic or? Um. Well, the one thing that I was involved with that was very physical, although I don't know, although you could look at it today and for sure see the athleticism in it. It wasn't quite so much at the time, but it, it was, and that was drum corps. I was in the color guard in a drum corps from 15 to 19, from the ages of 15 to 19. And um, that was fairly physically demanding. We, in the um, spring, started training, training, practicing, and uh, we, we did practice six, seven days a week, 10, 12 hours a day out in the hot sun, and we traveled my last year in core, I was in 14 states and performed before over 80,000 people. And so that was probably the, by far the most physically demanding thing I'd ever, I mean, that I did as a, as a young child. But I, in no way, shape, or form, considered myself an athlete. Those were the cool kids. Those were the kids that I went to high school with that were on the football team and the cheerleaders. And I didn't, I didn't run in that. I was considered a band geek because that's what I did. <laughs> well, I am, I am the proud father of a band member. Uh, my daughter played saxophone in her marching band. She's in college now. Uh, but it was uh, tremendously, tremendously athletic. She, she would drop weight every summer, fall, doing two-a-days. And, um, and her band was really good. And they performed all over the country as well. Where was she? What band was she in? What high so I live in Columbus, Ohio. Oh, okay. Uh, and she was, they're called Olentangy Orange, uh, but they've played in the college football playoffs. Uh, they've played different parades around the country and they're more of a show band. So they mm -hmm. do the dance moves while they play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very similar to drum corps. So, so that's what I was up to. But then after I, you know, I got married at 19 and left Kansas and uh, by 23 started our, my family. And so anything sort of physical went to the wayside. 
So you became an attorney at some point. Uh, when did when did you decide to do that? I did. I I refer to myself as a late bloomer. While I did start having my family at 23, uh, and we were a military family, my husband's retired Air Force, we uh, traveled a lot. And so we ended up in Utah. And at that time, during the Clinton administration, my husband was downsized out of the military. And um, there was a program called JTPOA. It was a Job Training Partnership Act. And they paid for him to go back to school. And I said, well, if you're going back to school, I've always wanted to go back to school. So at 36 and 40, we went to college and we just drug our little babies along with us. They were junior high and elementary school and one was tiny. And we just drug them to college at Weber State University and we got our degree. And while I was studying there, I had this incredible academic advisor who said, what's your plan? And I said, I think I'm just going to get a degree in communications. I, I think I'd like to be an investigative reporter. And he explored that with me and said, no, 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 no. You are way too smart for that. I really want to recommend one. I'm calling Ron Holt right now. I'm putting you in the honors program and you're going to law school. And I said, okay. And so that was the path I went on. So I didn't go to law school until I was 40. That's really cool. What, yeah. what, what were your thoughts when the advisor said that, no, you're, you're going to go to law school? Well, you know, I've been blessed in my entire life journey. Well, from the time I was 28 to have people in my life that believed in me more than I believed in myself. And uh, that was true. I'm a recovering alcoholic and drug addict. And I got clean and sober at 28. And there were people around me then that said, no, 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 you can do this. And so I got clean and sober and then I went back to school and I met Ned Laugh. And I just thought, you know, I just trusted a lot of, uh, I trusted some not so good people along the way, but I trusted a lot of really good people that um, believed in me. And I said, you really think so? And he's, yeah, he honestly had aspirations of me to go to an Ivy League school. He was promoting, I go to Cornell. I didn't score well enough on the LSAT to do that, but I did. I did apply to 10 law schools and got accepted at eight. And then I narrowed it down to the Pacific Northwest is where we wanted to live. So I looked at Willamette in um, Oregon and then Gonzaga and Gonzaga offered me some scholarship money. So I went there. That's incredible. That's an incredible school too. It is. And I was very fortunate. Um, They, when I went to visit them, that little law school was in an old rundown elementary school in in uh, Spokane and they had just built a brand new beautiful multi-million dollar law school and I was the first class to start and graduate in that building and it was it was really something it's a wonderful wonderful community yeah I've been to Spokane once Um, it's a beautiful town Uh, the pine trees are everywhere and the salmon is to die for yeah 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 you got to get that that Copper River salmon when it's in season is absolutely the best. Yeah. And the, and the campus is gorgeous. Yeah, for sure. For sure. It, you know, the Spokane River runs right behind the law school there. And when you go downtown, just a few miles from where the law school is, there's the beautiful falls. And every spring when the runoff comes after the snow in the mountains, it's, it's a pretty incredible, magical place. For me, when we decided to come to Houston, part of it, well, there's a lot of reasons, but one of it was, as I have aged, one of the things I don't enjoy so much is cold weather. (laughs) So one of the things we absolutely love about being in Houston is there's two to three months of fairly intolerable heat, like open the garage, slap you in the face, oh my God, I'm going to work out today heat. But the rest of the year, I can sit out on my deck and have coffee and it's lovely. Like today, fall is finally here and it's very exciting. Yeah. So I have to ask, you know, I I went back to school late in life as well and got my master's in business. Um, That almost, that almost got me a divorce. Uh, We had a small child. Um, My, I didn't see my wife very much during those times because it's very demanding. And I, and I can only imagine that law school was even worse than that. So being a recovering addict 
<laughs> and going yeah. back to school late in life with all yep. of that. What were the pressures of, of that? Well, my very, well, first of all, let me say the only reason, there's only one reason I was able to do it and do it successfully is I have an incredible partner. My husband and I have been married for 40, almost 42 years in June. And whatever I've, whatever I've pursued, he has always supported me. And we have been, we were co-parenting children when that wasn't a cool thing. Moms did it all, right? My husband has always risen to the occasion. And he um, said to me when I was choosing a law school, he said, you followed me for 20 years in the military. You pick where you want to go. I'll go. And he did. And he found a job there. So having a supportive partner was absolutely critical to my success. And the other thing was, I got really clear my first year of law school, I, I was so stressed out and in such fear about failing. The very first thing, because I am an addict, that came to my mind, if I could just drink, this would be okay. I could do this if I could drink. And right, I was 40 years old. I'd been clean and sober since I was 28. I mean, it's a real wake up call to go, I am forever an addict. I am. That's my first response to life is how can I numb this uncomfortable, painful feeling? And so I happened to have a professor um, who's no longer with us. And there was just something about him that said to reach out to him. And so I went to him and I said, look, I'm going to need a spiritual mentor to get through this. I can't do it. And I haven't, I'm, I'm new to the community. I'm an addict. I haven't been to any meetings, but I just felt really connected to you. He was six months clean and sober and took me immediately to an AA meeting um, in the back of a church with these rickety steps. And that saved my life. That's, you know, being back with my people. That's, that's my tribe. That's where I belong. When I'm in a, in a 12 step meeting, that's what works for me. That's what keeps me grounded. And so I knew that that meeting was there and I was able to access that while I was in law school, thanks to um, my professor. That, that's an incredible story. It's just, you know, you think about it or I think about it and I'm like, is, is it really that incredible? I mean, is it really incredible or am I just crazy or do I just have this, I don't know, insane desire to realize my full peak potential. I don't know where that comes from. I did not have a positive childhood and in, I still at 60 struggle with overcoming, you know, voices of negating parents. So I, I don't know. I don't know if it's incredible or it's just, I, I don't think it's incredible. I think that anybody that makes their mind up to want to know what the full expression of life is, can do it. And one of the reasons I agreed to do this with you guys, honestly, is that it's my hope. I've always said, I don't believe that I've had these experiences just for myself, right? It's impacted my family incredibly and my children are incredible human beings and attribute a lot of that to watching me go through what I've gone through. But I really was hopeful that by sharing it in a, with a larger audience that um, I would give them hope. I would um, move them and inspire them and enroll them in taking the journey themselves and, and create their own transformation. It isn't my transformation. I don't want them to mimic what I did. I just, I want them to know it's possible. It is possible for any human being to do it. And I said that about law school. People are like, oh, it's so amazing. You went to law school. No, it's not. I could teach anybody to go to law school. You, you, you can do it. You just have to make your mind up that you're going to do it. Well, that kind of jumps ahead where I wanted to go. But since we're down this path, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> okay. um, uh, so in, in researching you, I looked at your LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And you have a quote on your LinkedIn page. Uh, about kind of your goal and your mission. And it was uh, looking for an opportunity to be an advocate for individuals underrepresented, upper, upper, oh gosh, underrepresented with a dynamic organization. Yeah. And so you want to be an advocate for people. Correct. And this makes sense now as you're kind of disclosing your path to where you got to. 
Yeah, and and you know, I've done that in spits and spurts in my life. When I first became a lawyer, I went to work at a nonprofit organization called the Center for Justice that's no longer part of the Spokane community. And I, you know, this the current climate that we live in politically is very dear to my heart. I represented prisoners in the healthcare system accessing healthcare. And that morphed into excessive use of force. And I represented clients who had been beat or killed by the police. And believe it or not, my, my number one client was not a person of color. He was a disabled man. And the police beat him to death. And it resulted eventually after six years, and they're still fighting in Spokane for uh, law enforcement reformation. He, um, a, a police officer was convicted of violating his civil rights and went to prison. And the family was awarded a multi-million dollar um, lawsuit for his death. Um, I left in the middle of that, but I, I actually sat with his mother when she saw the video the first time of the police murdering her son. So mm -hmm. the people, the, the people that I connect with in my life for what, from my own brokenness or whatever it is, are the people who have been, um, it's not that they don't have a voice, they have a voice, it's just people have shut them up. And so that's, I don't know why that's my calling, or I feel like it's my calling, it's what I've done. Um, because even after then, I, I find myself in the, although I don't formally have a position, I do speak out in my community. I, I currently sit um, at our CrossFit gym. We have a athlete council board and um, I'm a member of the um, organization right now. And needless to say, and I'm sure we'll get into this when everything sort of happened with Glassman and CrossFit, you know, a lot of people were like, well, let's, let's take a wait and see attitude. And me and the true activist that I am, I'm like, no, I'm going to be clear about this. If this man continues to be a part of this organization, I don't care if it's $3 or all 150 of my dollars that go to CrossFit HQ, I won't be a part of it. I won't, which was a really difficult stance to take, right? My, well, calm down, Terry, you know, things will be, you know, I'm just not a centrist. I'm not a centrist. And I said to my organization, look, I vote with my dollars. There's other organizations I don't spend money with. And I was challenged by my dear friend and the chair of the committee saying, come on, Terry, you know, you spend money with organizations that you don't agree with. And I said that I'm sure that that's true because I don't research every single thing I do. But the minute I'm made aware of it, I'm not participating in it. So I guess that probably speaks volumes to how I've lived my life, not not necessarily the way a lot of people think I should, but it, I don't know how else to do it. And quite frankly, I've said, um, it's really the only way I stay sober. If I tried to be something or someone other than that, I'd probably drink again. That's really interesting. You know, that was a tough time for all of us. Uh, Kat and I have another podcast that we do that actually had the word CrossFit in the title. Uh -huh. We made the decision during that time to remove that name from the podcast, you know, at the expense of getting a new logo and um, yep. new branding and all of that, uh, because it's something that we as a, as a group couldn't, couldn't support anymore. Well, good um, for you. I'm proud of you. <laughs> Thank you for taking that stand, for actually taking a stand. It's important. And I was proud of all the athletes. I was proud of the affiliates that, de-affiliated. I mean, now they're at choice about whether or not they want to affiliate again, right? Since there's been this wholesale change. But I, I just, you know, and I had lots of questions about how could this have gone on for so long and blah, 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 blah. But the point is, I think it's important to take a stand. This middle of the road is why we're where we are today, right? So good for you guys. I'm proud of you. <laughs> so let me ask you this. We now have a new CEO with CrossFit. Have you done research to to align yourself back with CrossFit or are you still waiting to see what's going to happen? No, I, I absolutely from at least at the surface level, I haven't done a deep dive into Eric Rosa. Um, I mean, I think there's a couple of things. I think it's very clear that part of why 
he has this position is he's a good business guy. So that's going to make some changes, I'm sure, eventually that are going to ruffle some feathers. Although, you know, he seems more of the, what I would call the Simon Sinek version of leadership, which I love. I love Simon Sinek and everything he teaches about leadership. Um, I love the formation of the athletes advising him. I love the formation of the new union, the athlete union. I think that those kids have needed that for a very long time. I get why they couldn't have it as the sport was growing, why it was it would have been difficult to form, but I think the timing is brilliant, those those kids that have come together. So I think we're headed in the right direction. I really do. And for all the things that Glassman isn't or that I want to be affiliated with, you know, and I said this when people were saying, yeah, but Greg Glassman saved my life. Well, well let's get clear. Greg Glassman's methodology saved my life. I don't think Greg Glassman, based on what I've heard, could give two, you know, what's about me as a human being, especially as a woman his methodology and i'll give you that i will absolutely give that i'm grateful for the methodology um so that being said i think crossfit is back on on a probably a better track and you know absolute power corrupts absolutely and i think that that's what happened there were just way too many uh what do i want to say too, just he had too many eggs in his basket right there needed to be more of a and it probably had to happen that way or CrossFit wouldn't be where it is. But I'm very grateful that he's divested 100% of his interest. Um, I, I think it's just sort of ironic that we talk about health and fitness and CrossFit. And I said, part of health and fitness is mental health. <laughs> Clearly the leader of the organization had some issues there. So you can talk to me all day long about physical transformation and that's great. And it's one of the things, quite frankly, I love about my gym. Um, CrossFit Stonecutter, Josh Wilson, who is the owner and our head coach, he says, yeah, I'm not in the gym business. I'm in the business of developing human beings. We happen to use fitness as a methodology to get there, but it isn't, I mean, that's just a, portion of what we do right it's the holistic approach to how to be to realize what logan gilbert calls your full peak potential as a human being so you also do your jim's podcast i did my daughter and i've gone back and forth on that and she's back on it this this season okay so you rotate with your daughter so what what does that give you um in your advocacy journey and also your CrossFit journey? Yeah, it's a really lovely combination of the two, right? So we've had a lot of really meaningful discussions um, that Josh, quite frankly, a number of them have been Josh and I, and Josh and I have these conversations outside of the podcast or out, you know, at the gym. And so he and I have been able to really share that, those conversations with our audience. Um, and one of the key things that we've talked about a lot that I think is the foundation of why we are successful at Stonecutter, and that is um, our core values. The gym has a very clear set of core values that define who we are and how we hold ourselves with each other in community at that gym. And I'm super proud of that. And it's hard. Look, it's not easy. It's not just like we've got these nice words on the on the wall when you walk into the gym part of what the athlete council does is hold josh accountable to those uh core values as well right he's a human being he needs people to check on him just like we need each other and we've been pretty successful painfully so in some cases to have real hard conversations and they all stem from holding the standard of maintaining what those core values are. And so I feel like that was a way to be able to advocate for um, a, a holistic community to hold our community together. Who, who came up with those core values, Terry? Josh did. I, they were already there when I came to the gym, but uh, Josh had, I know that Josh has been 
highly influenced by Logan Gelbrick, who we now are all sort of um, Logan Gelbrick groupies, if you will, <laughs> his Going Right book. And um, Logan started Deuce Gym in Venice, California, and kind of considered himself, quote unquote, a pirate. And Josh really liked that whole concept. And so he had been studying Logan and the success of Deuce Gym in Venice for a couple of years, I think, before he even started uh, Stonecutter. And so he was pretty clear about having core values that would guide the direction of our community and that um, there would be an accountability piece to not just putting him on the wall and doing that, but there's this whole hold the standard that Logan talks about in his Going Right book about make sh making sure that we're not stepping over, but we really are holding each other accountable to those core values. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there one of those core values that you find more difficult to adhere to than the rest? Hmm. Is there one that challenges you the most? I think for me personally, my personal one probably is indomitable spirit. Like on some ways I think I do. And then other ways I'm like, no, you're kind of a, you can whine sometimes, Terry. And when things get really hard, you're, you know, where's that indomitable spirit? I mean, that's a big, that's a big thing. Indomitable spirit. When you just break that apart, just those two words, it's like, in my mind, which probably isn't the healthiest place to be in your life, in my brain. It's like, that's a never failing, always uh, present, I'll never give up sort of uh, way of being in the world. And I don't know that I'm always that way. And in fact, I'm working with Josh right now on my own development in recreating or creating, recreating um, my relationship to failure. I have an unhealthy, very unhealthy relationship with failure. And it's one of the reasons that CrossFit has been so hard for me because I want to, in my, I know this is going to sound absolutely insane. If I'm not performing at the level of a games athlete, why am I doing this? I know that, I know that sounds insane in no way, shape or form, but I always feel so much less than that's, that's about me. That's not about CrossFit. It's not about my community that supports me and everything I, I do and everything I've done. It's the insanity that I have in my brain. And so failure to me, so I finished last in the wad, that was a failure in my mind. And that means I'm a failure. And that's just not, Josh is really working with me um, on Failure is just simply, Terry, an opportunity. It's information that you take in and you say, okay, well, what about that? What, what does, wh why did I come in last? What do, how do I want to improve? Is really coming in last, does it matter at the end of the day, right? Josh, vis-a-vis -vis Logan, the commitment is to the process. And so that's what I just took on a big journey at the end of the year, I have set a goal. I'm participating in a pediatric cancer fundraiser called Snowdrop. And every year, and I did it last year, it's called the Ultra 55. And for 55 hours, we run. And I did it on a relay team last year. And this year, I've decided to run as a solo runner. And in those two and a half days, I want to hit my 100 miles. I have a little boy that was the grandson of some dear friends of mine from high school and he passed away from pediatric cancer. And so I'm committed, I'm doing this for Carter. And Josh said, I'll do this with you. You need to understand that if you don't hit the 100 miles, you haven't failed. You must be committed to the process and let go of the results. The results will be whatever the results will be. And there's gonna be things, Terry, that you can't control. There's a lot of things in your training you can control. You can't control the weather. You can't control that it, at mile 85, if your hips freeze up and you can't go anymore, that you failed. You will have learned something by that. So it's scary that I've like now even publicly told you that I'm up to this because if I don't achieve it because of my unhealthy way of looking at failure, that's probably going to be a lesson that I'll learn. Or 
I will in fact achieve it because part of, I said, my daughter said, mom, I'm not sure you should do this. This seems really dangerous. And blah. I said, Josh isn't going to let me do anything that's going to hurt me. One. And two, I will do this. If I have to crawl the last 15 miles, I'm going to do this for that baby, that baby that should have had his life. And I'm raising a few thousand dollars for pediatric cancer research. That's one of the most underfunded researches uh, in the cancer world. So I, I am going to do this. I'll let you know how it turns, what the consequences are. I'm training. I'm committed to the training one day at a time. We'll see what the consequences are on January 1st. So well, it, it sounds like indomitable spirit for sure. <laughs> so. <laughs> so that's a perfect segue, Terry, uh, to kind of rewind and mm-hmm. go back to your personal journey through all mm-hmm. of this. So you mentioned to us that, uh, that your childhood had some problems with it. <laughs> um, so can you share with us a little bit of what your childhood was like? Okay. I'm going to try to do this really just an abbreviated because at some point when you talk about it, I'm sure people go, really? No. Just say I had a father who um, was broken, broken, broken by his alcoholic father who beat him and blah, blah, blah. My parents, my mother was 15 when she married my father at 19. They had no business, no business having children. I don't care what they wanted to do with their life, but they shouldn't have children. And I am the firstborn child. So I'm born to my mother and father at 16 and 20, who had zero skills in raising a child. My mother had actually been abandoned by her mother at six months old and was raised in part by her grandparents until she was 12. When they died, uh, my grandmother had to go get her. Anyway, they just did not bless their hearts they did not have any modeling whatsoever on how to be a parent. So they did, I guess the best, they did do the best that they could, which wasn't so great. You know, it involved a lot of beatings. It involved as I, after I turned 13, the beating stopped, but the uh, mental beratement, I would sit in a chair for a couple of hours and listen to my father scream at me and, you know, tell me how smart I was, but I didn't have brains to come in out of the rain and blase, blase, blase. So that was an all day, every day sort of, you didn't know if you were going to sit down at the table and everything. So you always kind of, you know, it's like waiting for a bomb to go off. You just never knew. My father just raged. He was a rager. Did, did you have other siblings that you needed to look after or? I I did. And in fact, my mother, quote unquote, had a nervous breakdown when I was in fourth grade, maybe I was 10, 11 years old. And I was responsible for the house. So my father went off to work, my mother was hospitalized. And I had a sibling that was nine years younger than I was. So I dropped her off the babysitter, picked her up from the babysitter. Um, I fixed dinner, I took care of the kids in the house. And I started doing that at 10, 11 years old. And so, uh, and then when my mother came home, she suffered from, I don't know, I guess today we would call it agoraphobia. She couldn't leave the house. She didn't want us to leave the house. It was just weird. It's just weird. And in fact, you know, I'm so old now, I look back and both of my parents have passed. Um, It's when I talk about it, it's sort of an out of body experience. It isn't my life. It's so far removed. In some ways, in other ways, my father sometimes will still ride around in my head and I have to tell him to shut up. Um, But when my youngest daughter, who's now 30, was four months old, I divorced, I formally, if I could have filed legal paperwork, and maybe I could have, I would have, I divorced my parents. I didn't have any contact with them the last 25 years of their life. I just couldn't, I made the decision, I have these three babies now. And they need a mom that was as far removed from my childhood experience as could possibly be for them to be whole human beings. And my husband's life wasn't a whole lot better. His mom was, I often say there is a line out of um, the Prince of Tides, Pat Conroy, that I think is a brilliant line. And he says, my mother should have been raising cobras, not children. Well, that was my mother-in-law. So my husband and I together just decided 
the one thing that we were going to achieve in our lives was we were going to give our children the childhood we wish we would have had. Now, was it perfect? No, we were both broken. We both have made a lot of mistakes along the way. Um, I've been treated for depression and been on medication and, you know, went through a major depressive episode in 2009 that disconnected me from my kids and that I just couldn't show up. I was home, but I just couldn't show up. And so um, it wasn't perfect, but I am happy to report my children are now 37, 35, and 30. And I just sent them all messages last week telling them how proud I am that they're very engaged politically, they're smart, they're compassionate, they care about humanity, they care about the people around them, they care about the global community. And I was listening, I was listening to my youngest and my oldest have a conversation on the phone the other day. It is probably, well, it is without a doubt, the thing I am the most proud of that I've done in my life is to have these three kids that are out in the world, raising the consciousness of the community about what matters. And they're all very committed um, in terms of relationship, family relationship, global relationship. So that I'm really proud of. So in some ways, well, in a lot of ways, my husband and I feel have broken the cycle in our family. That's really what we are up to. And um, we only have two grandchildren. My middle daughter has two children. My oldest and my youngest don't have any children yet. Uh, and they're as committed, but my youngest is a school teacher and she brings all of this sort of the way I'm talking, you could hear her in the classroom. So I feel like we're trying to multiply the positivity of breaking the cycle and what we've, what we've done in our lives. So before you were able to break the cycle, did you come up with coping mechanisms just to survive that environment? Yeah, I started drinking at 14. I drank until I was 28 years old and you, and later in that started using drugs. So that was my, that was my outlet is drinking. That's how I got through it. And so at what point, did you realize that this coping mechanism was actually a hindrance? Did, did you come to an epiphany or did, were you brought by yeah, someone no, else? I came to an epiphany. I was 28 years old. I had two children. Um, we lived in a beautiful home in Enon, Oklahoma with a swimming pool. Like we were living the idyllic middle-class life, right? Little brick house, little swimming pool, two little babies. My husband and I, everybody's blonde headed and blue eyed and well, my daughter's a redhead. But anyway, we live the idyllic American life in the middle of Enid, Oklahoma. Like if you picked up a book, that's what people write about. And I was drinking. I would, I thought it was cool to drink Bloody Marys at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning while I was making pancakes for my children. The sad thing was that then that morphed into uh, red beers in the afternoon around the pool that really resulted in mom being passed out and the kids happened to be watched by the neighbor because my husband had to go to work. At some point in the middle of that, the lady that lived across the street was a sweet lady and she was connected somehow, I don't even remember now, to people in recovery and kind of challenged me. And so that sat with me for a little while. I knew I was miserable, but I didn't know really what to do about it. We then moved to Edmond, Oklahoma, a suburb of Oklahoma City. And here's how I started. I was overweight and I was addicted to sugar. So I went to a 12 step meeting for overeaters and I started down that journey and I decided to give up sugar because that was a problem. Well, what happened about nine months into being sugar free is I wanted to drink so bad. I couldn't like, I just was white knuckling it. And I happened to, be blessed to find this group of people that were all different kinds of 12 step, 12 steppers. Some were in AA, some were in NA, some were in OA. And I got invited to this home meeting with these people. And I heard the alcoholic sharing. And I was like, oh, wow, that really resonates. And I picked up the phone and I called one of those ladies and I said, hey, Emily, I have a question for you how do you know if you're an alcoholic? And I'll never, I mean, it's like it happened yesterday. She said, Carrie, people that aren't alcoholic don't ask themselves that question. And I went, 
wow. She said, I'll meet you on Saturday at the noon meeting. And I started in my recovery, my real recovery then. And that was 30, 32 years ago. That's so a that, great story. Yes. So that's ironic that your being overweight is what led you to discover that you were an alcoholic. So that's kind of what we wanted to like end this story on is the, po- the picture that was posted on uh, social media by CrossFit is a, a before picture with you being overweight and you conquering that as well. So ha- were you overweight your whole life? Was that something you always wrestled with? You know, I'm a serial weight. I probably gained and lost a thousand pounds in my life. I'm not exaggerating. I've, I've yo-yoed and yo-yoed like it would get out of control. I will tell you that um, once I was diagnosed with type two diabetes, which was probably 15 years ago, for a few of those years, quite a few of those years, I refused to do anything about it or take anything or, you know, they tried to put me on oral medication, it made me sick. Eventually it got so bad, they're like, okay, here's the deal. You now need to take insulin shots. So when I started CrossFit at 56, I was on insulin twice a day, uh, injections. I was on antidepressants. I was on cholesterol medication. I was on high blood pressure medication. I am not saying that what I did is advised by any physician. Please don't do this. Please consult your physician. I don't want to be accused of telling me. But I just went, F it. I am not doing this anymore. My daughter was a CrossFitter and had been really working towards getting me to the gym, which in my world, I'm a supportive mom. I've been a five-star soccer mom. I'll support you in CrossFit. It never occurred to me in a million years that I would do it. Well, she had a really sneaky way about it. And she introduced me to Zach Anderson and she said, mom, you're going to love Zach. And I went and met him at a a competition that those kids were doing. And I was just being the supportive soccer mom was my role and meeting her coach is what I thought I was up to. And then a few months later, the open happened in February of that year. And she was like, mom, come, of course I'll come watch you compete. Of course I'll come go. So we get to the gym and people are like, so when are you going to start doing CrossFit? I'm like, what are you talking about? This is my daughter's sport. I don't, I'm I'm a supportive mom. And there was a couple of ladies there that were bigger ladies. And I said to one of them, "Uh, were you an athlete in high school? That's what I thought. You're just out of shape and you're trying to get back in shape. She laughed and she said, are you kidding me? I took band so I wouldn't have to take PE. And I'm like, what? Well, then blessing of all blessings, Zach Anderson had an aunt who was older. She was in her 60s and suffering from Parkinson's. And he started a master's program at seven o'clock in the morning for ladies over 40. And so I started going with that group of ladies. There was about six to eight of us that Zach worked with. And truthfully, when we started out, we were doing what would have probably been equivalent to physical therapy. We were doing a lot of band work. And I'll never forget the first day he said, get on that assault bite and ride it for 10 minutes see how fast, you you know, see how many calories you can burn. Two minutes in, I got deathly ill and had to get off. And I'm like, oh my God, this is going to be awful. But I, I, I don't know why I just kept going back. That group of ladies really kept me coming back. And then at some point, Josh says, it's time. You need to go to regular Clark CrossFit classes now, Terry. I'm like, no, 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 no. Yes. Yes. And he pushed. And then that gym closed and I ended up at Stonecutter. So it was my daughter really who pushed me. And then my husband needed to be doing it too, but he was like, well, I'll go to support you. So now we all go and she's training to be a professional CrossFit athlete. And we just do the mom and dad thing. And since the COVID we have made it, we're 60 and 64. We've not been to the gym and our gym offers virtual. So every night at five 30, we turn on our computer and work out out in our gym, on our garage. That's incredible. But I did throw all my medication away. That probably wasn't, but I did. And now I'm only on one medication and it's for blood pressure. Because I've done everything. And my physician said, look, Terry, you've worked so hard to get where you're at. Do you want to have a stroke? So I don't know if it's genetic. I don't know. 
why, but I can't seem to get my blood pressure down to where it needs to be. So I do take that one medication. Do you participate in the open, Terry? I do every okay. year. Good. How do you feel about it moving to the, to the winter time? You know, I was just amazed at people, you know, I will say this about Logan Galbrick. He talks about those of us that will survive are the ones that are adaptable. I, I didn't see what the huge thing was about moving it to October. I will say this. I don't think we had the level of participation only because I think it conflicted with a pit, specifically families that had kiddos still, right? So they had football, Friday night football, and we moved it from Friday night to Saturday night at our gym. Uh, and it still just wasn't, it just timing wise didn't really work for people, I think. So I'm happy for it to go back to February. I, I love it. I love the community. You know, we have a potluck every Friday night when it's like so many gyms when uh, Friday night lights is over. So I, I think we'll get back on that schedule and people will really like it and we'll have more participation, which I think is a lot of fun. Do you have any interest in um, taking your level one, the, the level one certificate course, or maybe even coaching at some point? I do. I do. I will be honest. It terrifies yes, me. It <gasps> terrifies no. me the, to take the level one. My um, I'm involved in a program at our gym. We are a, a Phoenix affiliate. I don't know if you're familiar with the Phoenix program. It is an active recovery group. So it's for people in recovery. You need to have 48 hours of continuous sobriety. And then you can come and do what we call a Phoenix event, which is a 530 Friday workout. And Randy, who's my dear friend and coach, running coach, um, is our Phoenix coach on Friday nights. And it has to be someone in recovery that coaches that class. And I've always felt it's something I really need to do in case anything happened to Randy. So, I mean, Josh obviously can fill in for Randy as well, but I, that there's that. The other thing I've toyed with a lot in my brain is I really, and now they have the master's certification, right? Mm -hmm. Doing both level one and master's. I feel like there's a group of ladies out there that are very much like me and how I started. And those ladies, if you would have told me back when I started that I had to go in a regular class, I'm not sure I would have stuck with it. It's just super intimidating. I mean, even trans after a year of being in the ladies group and transferring was super intimidating. I mean, I'm glad I did it right at the end of the day, but I wouldn't want that to be a reason why, and I'm thinking specifically for me, women, that women aren't. Yeah, it's a barrier to entry, right? I mean, correct, correct. And so when people, I can't tell you the number of times I, although you probably get this, you do what? Well, I do CrossFit. No, 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 no. I could never do CrossFit. I'm like, yes, you can. If I can, you can. Everything's scalable. You don't, whatever you see on TV, that's not what we're doing. We do something else. And the way you see me work out today is not how I worked out four and a half years ago, right? It's a, it's a journey. It's a process. But convincing people of that, yeah. but even my, even my own daughter, I, I'm super proud of her. She doesn't, and I'm talking about my 35 year old, Emily, she doesn't um, want to do CrossFit because her sister has always been an athlete and it feels very intimidating to her and her sister's at the gym and does a really good job. However, she is participating in Camp Gladiator. And that works oh. for her. And I said, I don't care what you're doing. You're moving. And the truth is, we talk about our workouts all the time. I'm like, you call it Camp Gladiator? It's cross. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, it's interesting. I am. Um, that... <laughs> I started a, an affiliate in May, and it's called CrossFit Clarity. And the whole concept of it is to cater to people that would never think of walking into a CrossFit gym, right? So even the, the programs that we write, the workouts of the day are, are the scaled version of the workout, but it, we don't call it that. We just call it the workout, right? And, right. and so, so there's people no intimidation come in, about RX versus People scale. can do the workout that's on the board. The only people that might modify it are people that are more advanced. And I figure we'll put the burden on those people to make it harder like for themselves that. versus 
putting the burden on the people that are new having to scale down. So we just start with, this is what you're doing. And if you'd like to make it harder, figure out a way to make it harder, talk to your coach. Instead of, you know, the person that's maybe shy or intimidated, they don't want to have to go to the coach and say, well, what can I do instead of? Right. 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 Because other people don't have a problem with it. So I it's a completely love, different concept. Yeah. I love that just from a psychological perspective, because it doesn't matter. I, in both my gyms, the coaches were very good about saying psychologically, there's not a thing wrong with scaling. And to this day, Josh will say, you get the same stimulus. One of the things that I've done that's helped me get that, but it's taken me a long time is now I wear a whoop right? Mm -hmm. I do what I do. And my daughter does what she does. And we have the same strain level, right? She has to do that to get the same strain I do for what I do. But then that tells me I've scaled it exactly right for me. So I get some sort of confirmation about that. But the difference from a psychological perspective about what you're up to makes perfect sense. I don't feel like I'm less than because I'm scaling, right? right. This and is the workout. Right. And if every day you go into a gym and you know you're never going to do what's written on the board, that kind of sucks. <laughs> yeah. You know, for some, for some people, they, they want to see something that they can do. Where are you so, at, Kat? Where I'm in Delaware. Looking? I'm in Delaware. Yeah. Oh, well, good for you. Thank you for producing Joe Biden. That's just uh, that's yeah, my welcome. only political thing. <laughs> I, um, funny, funny story. I, um, there's a, there's a, a private school here called Archmere Academy where both the Biden boys went to Hunter wow. and Bo. And when I went to shadow as an eighth grader at Archmere, Hunter was one of the kids that shuttled me around, you know, for the day. So yeah, we know their family, their grandkids like Snapchat, my daughter. <laughs> it's it's oh, surreal. So She's like, I, th I think his grandson just Snapchatted me. I'm like, okay, then there you go. <laughs> oh, that's great. I yeah, love it. Yeah, it's super cool. So but anyway, I yeah. So I, go ahead, Scott. So I don't want to miss out on telling people about your transformation. So I want to make yeah. sure we get this into the podcast. Okay. After this hour, I have learned that you have been a badass your whole life. <laughs> I don't know. You know, about and that, so, but thank you. so, but you made a physical transformation and I what did. are the details of that physical transformation? Okay. So first, the first thing I always want to tell people when they ask me about my transformation is it didn't happen overnight. This is so far, so far, I've been at this four and a half years. It's hard to imagine your first day that you're going to do it four and a half years. So I'll tell you what, I have approached CrossFit the same way I have approached not drinking one day at a time. I don't, and I have, and I'll tell you the best advice, the not advice, but the best approach is Logan Gelbrick's going right. You decide that you're going to follow a process and you have got to let go of the results. You can't, I just don't think you can start out or I couldn't start out going, well, here's the thing, Terry, four and a half years from now, you're going to have lost 80 pounds. Um, you're going to be off all your medication except one. And um, you're going to be doing workouts you never dreamed you could ever do in your life, right? I, I would have been an abysmal failure. I simply did whatever I was told to do that day. And I did it consistently. Now, I've done a lot of tweaking along the way, right? I didn't just get to one thing and stick to it, and that was all I did. So when I started out at 56, I was postmenopausal. I was exhausted, physically, emotionally, mentally exhausted. So I tried for six months, and I would drag myself to the gym two, three days a week. That's all I could do. I literally couldn't get out of bed. On the advice of people, I sought out a medical community, and I started taking testosterone and vitamin D. I had to do things that would help me physically that I wasn't willing to look at, but I was so tired. I was so, I wanted to do better. So I had to, I had to add things along the way. My, I will, the one thing my coach said early, early on, and I said, wow, I got to listen to that. He said, Terry, Terry, listen to me. 80% of your results are in the kitchen. 20% happen in the gym. So I started on a nutrition journey. Is it the nutrition where I am today? Is that where I started? No, it's not. I was working full time. I was tired. I was trying to do this. And I, and I understand that this is a privilege. I began to um, order pre-packaged paleo meals and have them delivered to the gym. 
Again, I recognize that's a privilege. I went from that to when I went to my new gym, there was a new uh, gal there that did nutrition and I worked with Jen for a while and Jen would do our meal plans and tell us what to fix and we would fix it. She would decide on what our macros were and I did that. And during that period of time, I, I was eating and I kept thinking about it. I'm eating a lot of processed food. It was healthy, but it was processed, right? So there was bread that we used or there were tortillas that we used. There was all this, and I'm going to be, I hope this isn't inappropriate, but looking back, what we call it now is we were having sex with our pants on. We were wanting to eat naughty things, but we would find a non-naughty way, but it was still processed, and I ate that. And then when I started, I stopped working with Jen and started working with Josh, my coach. And Josh said, look, E. C. Sinskowski who has optimized me nutrition, all I want you to do, I don't want you to change anything except you've got to add 800 calories or 800 grams of fruits and vegetables every day into your diet. And so that has transformed us now. We just eat protein and fresh fruits and vegetables. I don't eat anything processed. I might use some little tesame that I know is a safe condiment on some chicken or something, but that's what we eat. We eat whole food. We don't eat processed food. And so, it, again, my point is, it's a journey, and you meet yourself where you are and do what you can with where you are. It's a little like Maya Angelou says, when you know better, do better. And so the knowing better happens gradually. And did, how much weight did you lose, or how many sizes did you go down, whatever you're more comfortable with? Well, I can tell you, I went from a size 20 and I now wear a size four. Wow. That it. is awesome. Yeah. And I, and I love that you stress the importance that it's a journey. It's not an overnight thing. It's something that you have to uh, take on uh, every day. And it's funny that you say that the EC way of the 800 grams of fruits and vegetables, Julie Fouché just had her on her podcast. And now that pursuing health is doing a challenge based on the 800 grams of fruits and vegetables and so many grams of protein depending on your body weight. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, exactly. Easy. Easy I love her. They're calling it the lazy macro challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's perfect. You know, my daughter has to dial in hers more because she's training for a specific thing, but it's, it's working for me and I'm, I, you know, I'm eating more fruits and vegetables, real fruits and vegetables today than I've eaten probably in my entire life. Yeah. yeah, it's got it. And it's still a, and it's still a challenge. I'm going to be honest. You know, my daughter and I go round and round. Mom, you're not eating enough. I still have this mentality that somehow if I train more and eat less, mm-hmm. I'm going to get better results quicker. And it's just, I, you know, I had a really hard training weekend, and I forced myself. I forced myself to make sure that I had the nutrition. I woke up this morning, I'm 96% recovered after 20 miles of running over the weekend. So yeah, you've got to, you've got to eat for performance and you got to feed your body. It's, it's a huge, I'm a nutrition coach and it's a huge misconception of, you know, I'll get women coming in that are doing CrossFit five times a week and they eat a thousand calories a day. Yep. You know, and I'm kind of like, no, (laughs) we're going to change that. It's such a shift, right? I'm 60 years old. What have I been told my whole life? Eat less, eat less, you know, calories in, calories out. So work hard, expend calories, but don't eat very many calories. And that's how you're going to, and I know, I know for a fact having, because I have lots of follow-up medically that um, if I'm not eating correctly, I, I get freaked out now when I start to lose muscle mass especially mm. at 60. I know yeah. how important maintaining my muscle mass is for my long, right? I'm in this for the long haul. The one phrase that uh, Glassman gave me that I still love to this day is you can do this or you can eat green jello the last 12 years of your life. And I'm like, no, hashtag no green jello. That, that's my thing. No green jello. So my coach will often say, you know, one of the movements I hate and we practice them all the time is the Turkish get up. And he's like, Terry, this is the ultimate no green jello movement. Just freaking do it. <laughs> right. 
That's funny. I, I, I like that you mentioned work, uh, you know, movements that you don't love. Are, are there some things that are your jam in the, in the gym? What are th- some things you love to do? You know, here's the, I'm going to be honest, out of all the workout stuff, it's not that for me. And it's so funny because it's so anti-CrossFit, but I really love running. Okay. I really love running. I find it super meditative. I'm by myself. I get to listen to the music that I want to listen to. Um, so for me, it's running. I can tell, I, obviously, this is not good. I can tell you the movements I hate. <laughs> I hate rowing. My husband loves to row, but I'm only five foot one. Like rowing isn't my jam. Um, I don't mind doing burpees. It's not my favorite thing, but I know that I have an advantage given, given my height. Sorry. Um, so um, I like a traditional like we did one Friday night with Randy, just a traditional uh, burpees, box step overs, kettlebell swings, like AMRAP. Those, mm-hmm. I really love just a traditional, straightforward CrossFit workout. Anything that has to do with <laughs> hard central nervous system stuff, I hate. It's the, the coordination thing at 60 to, to do... Although, you know, I started out, I couldn't even do that damn Turkish get up. And now I can do them. I don't do them heavily weighted, but I can at least do them and understand, not have to think about every single step to get my body to do it. Yeah. Well, Terry, this has been an awesome hour. I'm so oh, glad that you joined us. Uh, I'm so tr- glad that you had me. Thank you, you truly are a badass woman. Um, and it was so fun getting to know you. Yeah. And an inspiration. I think we're going to, you know, check all those boxes of the reasons why you wanted to come on here for sure. Thanks. Thanks you guys. It's been wonderful. I enjoyed meeting the two of you. (laughs) Same here. And thanks Kat for doing what you're doing for women out there. I love it. Yeah. No problem. I guess it's probably not just women, but everybody. Yeah. It's great. Well, thank you for joining us and we'll, we'll see you next time. All right. Thanks you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you.